Hi, this is Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSpool.com, and I'm here today to make another Kipper video for you per request. You know, I'm so happy that so many of you have now received your Kipper deck, which is of course for sale at your local metaphysical bookstore or from Amazon.de or Amazon.com. The positive reviews the deck has been getting are really exciting. And again, I'm so grateful for all the support you've given Churo, Suzanne Zitzel, and myself over all these months while we were working on the deck. I've been traveling, as you know, all summer, and I'll continue to travel into the fall, so I don't know when I'll be able to make the next video for you. But I did want to take a moment from here, my home in Copenhagen, Denmark, and make a quick video for you per request on using the houses with the Kipper deck. So, you know, there are basically uh, many ways to read the Grand Tableau. I have sort of a, a core nine-step process, and you can expand that into 12 steps if you want, but usually the core nine steps are pretty much enough to answer anyone's question exhaustively, but you can go ahead and do the other three steps if you like. And One of these three steps uses the houses in a counting method, the so-called nine, thir nine and 13, or nine plus four step. And this is just an easy way to count through the grand tableau using the houses to get a nice read uh, of whatever your or the sitter's question is. It's really fun, it's really easy, and as I said, it's a great way to learn and practice working with the houses. So let's just go ahead and do that. I'll just pop over to the other side that is a static video portion with a voiceover where I'll just quickly flash up on the screen my simple house meanings and how I use the Kipper houses and then we'll go uh, to a second static picture of a grand tableau and just count our way through. I hope that you find this educational, useful, and clarifying. I do hope that you keep using the Kipper cards and that more of you find the benefits of the Kipper. It's no sugar coat, psychology, its directness, its charm, its sweetness. Anyway, I do hope you enjoy this video. Again, I'm very grateful. And until I make another video for you, enjoy your summer. Enjoy your cards. Hi, here's Fortune again. I'm back on the other side in the static portion of the video, just as I promised. So as you look at the screen there in front of you, you can see my little mini table of house definitions. And you can see that the definitions of the houses are very similar to that of the actual card, right? Um, of course, though, they do have an expansive range of meanings because the kipper is uh, as you know, psychological and filled with emotional states. So this means, for example, that if you have the child and you're looking at, you know, position 18 as the house of the child, when you lay out the grand tableau, right, then <coughs> you can interpret the card that sits on top of that house, the card that is in position 18, in the grand tableau, no matter what card it actually is or whatever you know individual number it has, if it's the 18th card in the overall grand tableau, then we understand that that is in the house of the child, right? And so, of course, that can mean that it's the card in that house refers to a literal child, refers to something new, refers to something about which the sitter or topic is naive or young. It can refer even to a time or season, such as spring. It can also refer to a state of being, as I said, or a state of becoming, what the sitter is about to give birth to. Right, So this whole range of meanings should be considered for the houses as well as for the cards themselves. And so as you go through and you look at the meaning of the cards in their absolute position in the grand tableau, that is, in their house position, you should always keep these full range of meanings in mind. So now let's go back and just quickly rehearse for people who you know may not have watched the video all the way through, but we'll just have a, a quick recap here, right, on what the houses are. So, you know, we have a deck of 
of 36 for a standard Kipper or 39 for Chiro Marchetti's Fantasy Echo Kipper cards, right? And they're numbered 1 to 39 due to their origin as a board game, right? When I would have just laid them out, you know, in order, 1 to 36, 1 to 39, I would have put my ring down at the starting position and we would have all rolled a die, you know, and we would have all moved our little rings or tokens according to the dice and followed the rules of the game, right? Because Kipper, like Lenormand, you know, begins as a, you know, parlor game and its root is in all of these wonderful 19th century and earlier German parlor games. So <clears throat> when we when we look now, you know, at how we use the Kipper, how we read the Kipper, right, we shuffle the deck so the cards are not necessarily going to be laid out in order, right? And uh, yet, even though the cards themselves can come out, you know, in whatever order, according to the shuffle, we always look at the grand tableau with houses as if underneath the cards that are actually in the table, there's a secret or or unseen version of the deck, right, that is in its proper order, where all of the cards are from 1 to 36 or 1 to 39 in the case of Chira's deck, right? And so we, we always refer to that secret, unseen, proper order of the cards, right? As if they had been laid out for a game as the houses and in their correct order, right? So when we look at the cards that we have actually dealt in the table, the card that is in the first position, the first card in the grand tableau, which is on the upper left-hand corner, right? We always figure that as being in house one, which is of course the house of the gentleman with the house of the main man. So, you know, that's how we calculate the houses and we just count through and, you know, we discover what card is in what house. And that's just a quick review of what the houses are and how we find out what they are for those um, who may have needed a quick refresher. All right. So, <clears throat> with that said, you know, um, as you go through the reading, it's often useful when looking at the grand tableau to consider not only the relation of the cards uh, in their position to each other, you know, what card modifies what and how it may modify it and what its relation to the topic card or the significator card is, but also to look at its absolute position on the table, and that is to look at the house. You don't always have to look at the houses, as I've said before when you read the Grand Tableau. If you want more information, the houses are, you know, available and they can be clarifying, but it's often that you don't need, you know, that you don't need them, but if you're interested in them or if you want to look at them, do definitely, you know, check in on them as a way to clarify the re reading or to add more depth, you know, to your possible meanings. But there are many professional readers who very rarely, if ever, use the houses. I certainly met several in Switzerland. So, you know, just experiment with it and see if it works for you. It can be overwhelming the first time that you start reading with the houses. And so I like to start the people that I teach in my personal classes, you know, that I have in person every month, um, just doing s this simple chaining exercise, you know, where I just start with a significator. And I do the simple counting, right, where with the significator as the first card, as number one, right, I'll count nine cards down, right, and then I will begin to, you know, pair the card with its house and build up a story by chaining the cards as I count them, right? So um, I I'm going to just go ahead and, you know, stop here now and pop up, you know, the actual grand tableau that I'm using and go through this actual chaining process of counting and the houses. Again, it's the method of... of 9 plus 4, or 9 and 13, depending on how you like to use that terminology. But we are definitely going to count 9 cards, and then we're going to count 4 more to make the 13. We're just going to go ahead and count our way through the grand tableau. And this means that sometimes you can go through the entire tableau more than once until you return to a card which you have already used. And once you return to a card that has already been used in your process, then you stop and the chaining is over. So that's kind of just what I wanted to... Um, explain that to you. So I'll just pop up this uh, grand tableau here. I won't go through um, necessarily all of the houses. I'll leave some for you to explore for yourself, but I will go through five or six of them just so you can see how the operation functions, and I'll be very interested to see if those of you who are commenting on social media, as you know, I have a Facebook page, I have an Instagram page, right? <clears throat> I have all these uh, social media pages. Um, 
especially my Facebook page is a great place to comment, not Fortune's Fool on Facebook, to just go ahead and, and you know, uh, go through and finish the reading or do as much of the reading as you would like so you can actually get practice for yourself in this example and just add that to my Facebook page. And I think that'll be a great method for community discussion. So I'll leave that open for you. Uh, of course, if you have any questions about the process, don't ever hesitate to contact me on social media, on Instagram, or on Facebook, and you know, go ahead and leave your question, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So, with that said, I hope that it, uh, you know you take a moment now to pause this portion of the video, take a screenshot of my little house meanings, and either print that out or you know take notes from that, and then we'll use that in the next portion of the video, which is coming up in just a moment. So, again, thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you in just a moment for the actual reading and interpretation portion. Hi, here we are again back on the other side, the second static portion of this video. You can see here that I have the grand tableau laid out. And so hopefully in the previous portion you have already copied or taken notes on the house positions. So before we get started, let's just talk for a moment about the grand tableau layout of the Kipper overall. Um, some people lay it out in rows of eight, as I tend to do, and other people lay it out in rows of nine. The original instructions, the AKA pink sheet, right, um, says to use rows of nine. Uh, and some people like that, and a lot of people do that. I, I don't like the row of nine personally. I just don't think it works as well for me as rows of eight. But you know, I encourage everyone to experiment um, and, you know, see what works for them. Rows of nine may work for you. Some people read only in rows of nine. Other people's read in rows of eight. Um, with Chiro's Kipper deck having 39 cards, you could do rows of nine and then have three at the bottom, you know, or you can do it as I have in rows of eight and have seven at the bottom. So it just, you know, just experiment with whatever layout works for you. This is just the layout that works for me and that I like to use, but you know, again, as I said, uh, you can use uh, anything that you like. The The house positions, you know, are going to stay the same. The ninth position is always going to be the ninth position, whether it's at the end of a row or whether it's the beginning of the next row. It, it'll still, you know, work for you. Just, uh, just see what you feel most comfortable with. So uh, let's go ahead and talk for a moment about this situation, which I'm going to, again, you know, modify the details a bit to protect the confidentiality of the sitter. And I'm very grateful to all of the sitters who allow me to, you know, roughly massage and use their core issue for these teaching examples. But we have to, of course, be ethical and protect their confidentiality. So here today we have Paul. Uh, Paul, of course, has a question about work. And his issue is that he's worked for several years at a very small family company. Uh, he describes it as being started by family and feeling like family. Uh, he's very devoted to that a place and he's very loyal to that, which of course is so unusual these days. And when you can find a location or a situation like that, naturally, of course, everybody wants to keep one, right? Uh, so the issue is that the business is, of course, growing. You know, that's good, right? And as a result, they're going to merge some departments. So um, this means that the supervisor right above, you know, Paul is going to change and he is going to lose the group, the core group of people he had been working with as they go into this new department. So naturally, he is concerned about his new boss and he's concerned about any change to what's been such a beneficial and even homey situation. So. When we start by, you know, evaluating the grand tableau, I like to start looking at the corners, right? The, the diagonals of the corners, as those of you who follow along with my grand tableaus know. And so there we can see that the Paul himself, the main man, right, is sitting there in house eight on the upper right-hand corner. And so looking at the diagonal there, we can see that his diagonal... Uh, on the opposite uh, diagonal corner is the community, right? This is the people, his work group, the people he's always felt so close to in this small family firm. And then we can see in the top right-hand corner, right, 
the living room or things that are close to him, things that are near to him in time, things that, you know, have doors and could even be, you know, his personal office, his personal space at the job. And, and both in a literal way, I mean, he would have to move his office, right? And also in a, in a psychological way, he would lose his space, his workspace, the group that he's been working with. And as you can see by looking at the bottom right-hand corner, that decision has been made. We can also look at the living room in terms of time in that it's a decision that's been made very recently, right? So it's near to him in time. It's right next to him. It's touching him very personally. So I like this uh, opening. I like th the way that the sitter's question, sitter's issue is reflected in the corner of the cards. And so that's very nice. But let's go ahead and talk then uh, for a minute about how we're going to use the houses when we go through and do this counting and chaining that I've mentioned several times before, right? So there are a number of ways to read the houses. Some people read the houses as the dominant subject and the card that is in the house as the modifier. I tend to read it just, in fact, the opposite way. The card that you see on the table is still the main subject and it is the house that is the modifier or that adds flavor to the subject of the cards. Again, you can experiment either ways, seeing which is the quote-unquote more prominent card, whether it's the card that you see on the table or the house position. Choose whatever works for you. You know, many, many people read uh, in many ways. There is no one way to read the Kipper. I've experienced that, you know, personally as I've traveled across Europe. So... Um, you know, just find what works for you, experiment with what works for you, but that's how I am personally going to read it. So if we start, you know, in this way, we look at the main man because we always begin, you know, um, the grand tableau by finding the significators either for the person or for the topic that in question, right? And that, of course, would be, you know, the main male, card number one, which I like to call the gentleman, just colloquially, even though that's not the formal name of the card, uh, long time followers know that I I have, you know, colloquial names for the cards to try to make their function clearer, right? And sometimes Chiro has adopted those and sometimes he has not. But this is just the shorthand that I often use to refer to the cards to help people think about their function and the characters that they are as psychological states. Because remember, to my mind, the Kipper is psychological. It talks about emotional states, it has the characters and people of a complex 19th century novel, and that's an element I try to bring out in my readings and an element that makes it much different than the Lenormand. So, um, you know, that's just going to be the continual kind of focus here. So if we look at uh, the gentleman card or the main male, we can see that it's in house eight. It's in position eight on the table, right? If house number one is on the upper right-hand side, which would be living room, right, we can see that the main male, our significator, is in position number eight, house eight, right, which is, of course, false person. So um, this suggests immediately that his concerns about what will happen with his new supervisor and what will happen to his position may be, you know, justified, right? So um, we'll want to look into that. The false person card can be a card of deception, of betrayal. So, you know, we'll have to see what his, you know, new position will be like. It could also be the fact that he's just being anxious, but at the moment we don't know until we actually go through and do the counting and, you know, start chaining together the reading and talking to him about the situation so we can help him clarify his own thoughts and feelings in an objective manner using the cards as a mirror, which, as you know, is always my technique. So if we start the counting, right, if we count nine cards with number one beginning at, you know, the main male, and we're going to, you know, move in the direction that the main male is looking, right, we come then, this means that we will be counting to the left, and our ninth card will be in, of course, you know, house nine, right, which will be the, here, the official person, the military person, or as I like to call him, the field marshal, right, doesn't he look like a field marshal from an, a BBC drama? So, of course, this is in uh, house nine, which is change, card nine moves, right, so this talks about the changes in movement, which is happening, and how this is 
you know, official, this is really happening, and how it also, it's out of his control, right? The decision was made above him, and there's nothing that he can do about it. It's not necessarily good or bad, but, you know, it is definitely going to go down, and his task is to, you know, adjust to that, work with it, deal with it, see how it's going to work for him, integrate this big change to his personal and to his emotional life. Because, you know, Paul, like many, many people, male as well as female and other, uh, you know, really find themselves in their work and they strongly identify with their position at the job. So, you know, this is really a, a big change for him as it would be for many people. You know, a uh, house nine moves or change can also, as a house, talk about the need to be agile, the need to change yourself and the need to accept change. And this may be something, you know, that just Paul just has to work through for himself and, and see that the loss of the current structure you know, is not going to be as bad as it seems to him. And it may be something that he can adapt to and will actually benefit from in the long run with a positive attitude. So let's just go ahead and, and keep reading through the cards, keep reading through the chain and see, you know, what the simple message is. Uh, so then if we count four from that, right, understanding that uh, the official person, the military person, card 22 is 9, then we're going to go ahead and count 4 from that to get the 13. And again, we're going to be uh, counting, you know, in the same direction, snake-wise, right, so we've counted to the left, and now we're going to count forward to the right, right, because we're still following the quote-unquote, gaze or direction of the main male. And so this is going to take us uh, to the rich, mature man in house 13, right? Um, and because, you know, 9 and 4 is 13. And this is the, the, you know, the house of the rich young guy, right? So we can see that uh, a key person who's involved in this is an older man who's been kind of a mentor or an executive. And, and we can see that he is a financial person, Right, the rich young guy is a financial person uh, who deals a lot with money and financial advice. And so, when we talk to Paul, we discover that in fact the uh, the drive for this department merge does come from a cost consolidation measure. But it's it's not you know in a brutal way. It's just meant to reorganize the company to help save the company money. And it was formed by uh, it was in fact proposed by what you might call the chief financial officer or you know, treasurer or CFO type person at this small company who just thought that by merging these two departments, they would be able to save a lot of money in purchasing. And that's, you know, Im important when you're a small business, right, is to save money and preserve your cash flow. So, you know, that's a, a interesting bit of confirmation, again, that comes to the cards. So let's go ahead and we're going to count four more again, right? This takes us to Distant Horizons, card 36, or, you know, Great Hope, Great Water. And this is in House 17 the house of the gift. So, you know, this is really an interesting card because this card can, depending on, you know, its position and which card you believe is the subject card and which card you believe is the descriptor card, can mean that your greatest hope is coming true, your wildest dreams are being fulfilled, or that your dreams are unrealistic, right? So in the method that we, um, you know, that I have it now, right, I have it really as the main card. And so with gift, I think that this makes, you know, how 17 that it's in is in fact gift, right? So I think that this means it's a highly positive card. I think that Paul will find in the long term, right, um, that he will really benefit from this change. And by long term, remember, I generally see the grand tableau as being a, about a six month to a year kind of time period. So really, uh, in a relatively short period of time, at maybe six months, maybe a year, Paul will see, could see a lot of benefits personally, um, you know, from this uh, merger, right? So then let's go ahead and count forward again. And so now things get a little more um, difficult, right? So uh, we move forward to house 21, which is card 24, thief. So, you know, house 21 is living room. So this does suggest that, you know, he is, there is going to be this sense of loss that's very personal to him. And the living room, again, is things that are near to you, that are personal to you. He will feel a real sense of loss as his work group is broken up around him, right? But that doesn't mean that, you know, this kind of change is going to be bad, right? He can forge new relationships in this 
new combined department, and, and by working hard with a new group of people, he might be able to benefit and even, you know, acquire a promotion in this new structure. So, you know, I want him, however, not to be afraid, right, because we always want to encourage our sitters and querents to have positive attitudes, to meet challenges with optimism, right, to understand that they can do, that they are change agents, that they are empowered, right, but also to give himself time just to feel the natural mourning that you would, you know, expect under such a massive change. So, uh, then go ahead, let's count forward uh, four more. This would take us to House 25. This is the House of High Honors, right? And the card we find in that house is 39 Community, which is a card that's an extra, a quote-unquote extra card that's unique to Chiro's deck, right? And this shows that, in fact, in, in his new community, in his new work group, right, he will be successful, right? High Honors is a card of, of success and recognition. And this goes forward, to my mind, to reinforce the... the um, uh, you know, distant horizons gift combination that we saw earlier. But, so this change could actually be really good for him. So uh, again, I'm feeling like this is a really, you know, um, positive uh, reading for him so far. Then if we count, if we count forward, you know, four more to house 29, this is prison. And then we see courtship. We see, you know, courtship how, card four. So now this is a an interesting place because you know uh, the prison is not uh, always such a positive card. In fact, it's a very challenging card. It's not one of the more empowering or enabling cards, right? It's a how it's a card that indicates you know being stuck, being held, uh, moments of confusion for indeterminate lengths of time, loss of action. Right, and so here we see him, you know, um, in a meeting situation, or like you know, in his business partnership kind of, you know, his 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 meeting and friendship kind of situation here. So when we look at his business friends, right, there is going to be again that sense of loss. There will be this time of you know uh, paralyzation that always happens when you have major changes in business, right? These kinds of things are never one hundred percent smooth. There is going to be confusion. There is going to be hesitation. You know, some things are going to be, um, you know, snafu'd, uh, and he just, you know, will have to kind of like wait through that. He, he's going to kind of just need to be patient with that and maintain his business friendships and his business relationships and support other people as this kind of, you know, business process of change, which is never perfect, you know, uh, goes on. And I think that's perfectly uh, normal. And again, that's something that, you know, you could reasonably expect. So this is how I go through and I read the houses. And if you keep counting, you can see, for example, that soon you'll come to house 33, the house of concern. And the card there, of course, is card 28, expectation, right? So it's natural to expect that there are going to be some elements of this change that you're not going to like and that are going to be concerning and troubling to you, right? But again, you have to have this positive attitude Keep focused on that combination of distant horizons and gift there, right? But I, you can see in this way the Kipper is very balanced, right? It doesn't promise you a perfect life because, of course, Lord knows no one has a perfect life. No one has, you know, a perfect job without troubles, stress, or business reorganizations, right? So there is a balance there, you know, but... The idea is, again, to roll the changes, have a positive attitude, right? See that as a gift, and then, you know, to keep on going. So having, you know, done this uh, for a bit, as I had stated earlier, right, I didn't want to read uh, the whole tableau to you. What I wanted to do was I wanted to read out the next cards that I would count through and pair together for the reading and then ask all of you to, you know, do the work for yourself, kind of follow up and follow through with the situation and post the comments and your interpretations of the houses and the cards on my social media, on my Facebook page in the comments so that everyone would get practice, you know, reading and learning and talking talking about it in a group collaboration style. So often, you know, I make these very long videos where I do all the talking, but I would really like to create a space for you all in the community to have some feedback and where we can work together both on my Facebook page and, if you like, also on my Instagram page, which is also called Not Fortunesful. So let me, from this moment on, just go through and read 
the next set of cards you know that I would walk through and you can think about how you would interpret them and as I said leave comments on my social media pages. So from here I would go on to house 37 which for Chiro is poverty and that card there that we find there is 15 lovers, right? And then uh, I would talk I would go forward from there around the curve, right? We're going to count back through the tableau in the same direction until we get to a card that we've already used, right? At which point the reading ends. So then we would go through, uh, right, to a house in the, the house of the house, in the house of message, excuse me. So we find card 20 house and house 7 message. And then we go through... Uh, again to house three, which is the house of marriage, and you can see we see toil and labor there. Then if we keep the count going, right, we would find 31, the card of bad health, in house 14, right, which is a message of concern. So again, you know, these, there are always minor setbacks, there are always problems, and you can see, you know, that, that it's not going to be a completely smooth process. <coughs> Right? Then let's again go on and keep counting. And then we see in house 10, which is journey or the house, you know, of the voyage, right? We see message of concern, card 14. Then as we go on, we keep counting, right? Uh, you know, we can just keep counting four and four and four and four and four and four and four. And, four. and so I would like you to go ahead and do that and, you know, in write out these interpretations and do the counting in the social media and tell me how you feel about that. And of course the reading will end after, you know, uh, seven or eight more moves and it will end back on bad health if you go through and you do this counting four, 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 four in the same direction. So you'll wrap around the tableau again and go through back to bad health. So I hope you found this to be helpful. If you have any more questions about how to do this or how to apply this principle of just going through and chaining the readings by, by you know, pairing the houses and counting through the tableau, um, as we pair the houses with the cards, then uh, don't hesitate to ask. I'm really glad that this topic came up as a question from a follower. I'm always very happy to take uh, your questions and topic suggestions and make videos on them as I have time. I'm also very grateful that this deck has been so popular and so successful. It's apparently, I'm told by the publishers, selling very well. And since, of course, the deck was released in the middle of August when most people are vacation, uh, on, on vacation, I expect that the sales will continue to pick up strongly through the fall and the holiday season. So, uh, again, I'm very grateful for all your support. I'm very grateful for the fact that you've been interested in the Kipper and interested in my videos. And I look forward to making another video for you soon. So until then, enjoy your cards.